Yeah, it's live. Okay, since we're about five after, I guess we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I guess I should stand over here in front of this webcam. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Holland Emery. I'm the Director of Education, Outreach, and Diversity, and I'm going to introduce Dr. Jen Heemster for her talk today. So she is an Associate Professor of Chemistry here at Emory, and she did her BS at UC Irvine and her PhD at Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and a brief stint in industry, and then a postdoc at Harvard. But we're not really here for that part of her career. We're more here for her advocacy work for students and for positive cultures in workplaces. Um, she currently, uh, you might know her on Twitter, at Jen Heemstra, or uh, through her work from, uh, in chemistry and engineering news in the advice column, Office Hours. But with that, I will turn this over to her and let her talk. Thanks. Yeah, and with that, um, I'm going to actually tell you about psychology research today. So, um, welcome to everyone who is physically here and those who are joining us online. Um, hopefully, I think you'll be able to see me if I'm here. Um, so, yeah, this is, is always a fun talk to put together and to present to graduate students and postdocs because um, there's really kind of, as you'll see, a lot of different plot lines because you know, as we've done this project, I think everyone in my group can attest, like we're actually almost like living the research, that we're, we're doing research around this topic that impacts our daily lives. Um, and so hopefully you'll see that this impacts you as a researcher, as a grad student who has to deal with failure in your experiments. Um, it impacts you in that you probably TA and teach or mentor undergraduate students. And so you have to think about how we prepare undergraduate students to be able to do research and know that research involves failure. Um, and then also, um, it's really fun to present this because when I was a grad student, I didn't even know that there was this whole field of discipline-based education research. You know, I thought there were people who taught and people who did research, but I didn't realize that there were people who researched about how we teach. Um, and a lot of people who end up in that career path actually start out with PhDs in chemistry or biology or physics. Um, and so I think it's, you know, hopefully really fun to see kind of this, alt, you know, different career path that you can take with a PhD in chemistry and that there is this whole other area of research out there that's incredibly, incredibly interesting and is absolutely an option um, from a degree in chemistry. Um, so with that, I actually want to start with a confession because I think that's a great way to start any talk. Um, and that's about a conversation that I have often. So um, I'm going to tell you about psychology research. And you might think, oh, I bet she just feels like super comfortable doing that. Like she seems really excited to talk about it. Um, it's probably all great. Um, but a conversation that I have often, especially, you know, a year or two ago, is I'd be talking with a colleague and say, hey, you know, me and a bunch of friends, we started this education and psychology research project. Um, and it's super, super fun, but it also terrifies me. Um, and they'd be like, well, why is that? Why is it terrifying? I'm like, well, like this is all new to me. Like, you know, I'm still learning. I don't know a ton about this yet. Um, and, you know, we decided to just launch it as a nationwide network. We decided to go from like zero to like all across the country all at once because I'll talk about why. Um, we just thought it'd be better that way. And I say, I'm terrified we'll fail at it. Um, they're like, well, what's your research project about? At which point I say, overcoming fear of failure. I'm like, yep, I see it, I hear it. Um, but that's my confession. Um, so now it's your turn to participate. I promise this isn't too painless or too painful. Um, so take a minute and log in. This is a poll everywhere. If you've never done a poll everywhere, it's totally anonymous. Um, so you can either text this in uh, to 22333 or you can go to this website. I'll give you 10 or so seconds to do that. It takes me like 10 minutes to text something like that, but I'm really slow. So. All right, and it'll show up on the next slide too. So if you're not quite in yet, um, here we go. I should like log in and do my. That work. One word. You can be specific. Excellent. 
interesting one. Experiments, research, job, education. So like 10 seconds more. I'll see if we get a few more. Yes, that's a lot of really important things. There's a lot of really important things where we have to deal with this fear of failure. Um, and so how do we deal with this? You know, how we'll talk a lot about how you can deal with this. Um, but right off the bat, I'll say, you know, how we dealt with it of like, we have this big project, we're really terrified to fail. Um, the thing that made it possible to deal with this, I think, above all things, um, is that we all surround ourselves with really great people. Um, and that that's a huge part of this job is that the people that you get to work with. And so right from the bat, I want to start off thanking uh, kind of all of the people in this photo. So this is our um, nationwide network and maybe um, some people on the call or even in this photo, I think. Um, but basically, we, we said we want to do this new thing. And, and I realized this isn't my area of expertise. But we can bring in people from psychology, from education research people who are teaching STEM classes like me, and let's get us all together. Um, and all of, with all of our shared knowledge, we can tackle this big problem. Um, and so why do we all come together to do this, right? This is uh, this last May, we're all here right outside, you know, about 50 feet from where I'm standing right now. And so why did all of these people spend, you know, two days in Atlanta in May um, to talk about failure? Um, and it's because, you know, we're all scientists. And so we know, and you, everyone in this room, we all know that failure, you know, it's painful, um, unavoidable. Oh, and the lights go down. I guess I don't move enough when I talk. But um, it's painful and unavoidable, but it can also be a key uh, step on the path to success. It can be essential. You often have to fail in order to succeed. Um, and so we know that, you know, kind of, turning a failure into a success requires perseverance and resilience. You need to be able to try again and keep trying new things. Um, but then we realized, well, when, when do undergraduate students acquire these skills? You know, certainly we're not teaching undergraduate students resilience as they convert, you know, grams to moles and moles to grams in their freshman chemistry class, right? Um, we're not even teaching it when we say, okay, you're going to synthesize aspirin for the two billionth time in the history of organic chemistry lab. And, you know, if it doesn't work, you did something wrong. There's no such thing as kind of let's try again, let's try differently. And so we realize that there's this huge gap that students need these skills to be successful these skills to be successful, but we're not doing enough in our curricula to kind of really impart those skills. And, um, and as I'll tell you, it even started thinking about how we build more of this into our graduate curricula as well. Um, all right, so uh, circling back though, you know, kind of backing up, you're like, okay, well, we're really, you know, there, there is, I have a huge fear of failure in a lot of areas of my life. Um, so how do we move past that? Um, well, the good news is that we, we all kind of already know how to fail. Um, I grew up playing golf, so I learned a lot about failure playing golf. Um, anyone else? Anyone else in this room play golf? No? How about mini golf? Any, all right, a few hands, cool. So if you kind of, you know, take a look, you know, if you really kind of, you know, this is how a scientist approaches mini golf, right? I look at this and I'm like, okay, from, you know, a social science perspective, when you look at a hole in mini golf, um, you know, you're always hoping for a hole in one. That's what we judge as success. Um, but sometimes this is almost, you know, geometry tells us that this is almost impossible, right? Um, this is maybe like a little bit of an easier one, but um, I got tired of Google image searching for difficult hole in one golf holes. So this is what we have. Um, but what do we do, right? When we're in this situation, um, you know, you plan out, you're not, without even thinking about it, you know, you just step up, you're having a good time. You're planning out what you think is the best option. You're executing that plan to the best of your ability. Um, and if you're successful, you know, you celebrate victory. And if you're unsuccessful, do you do that? No. <laughs> if you're my six-year-old son, you do this, right? But if you're hopefully a grown person, you don't do that. Uh, so we don't do that. You know, you just reassess. You're like, ah, oh, shucks, darn it. Um, maybe you say something a little bit more, more vivid than that. But, um, but you just keep trying and you're like, oh, okay, well, that's going to be on the scorecard, but whatever, I'm going to keep trying. I get what I get and there's always the next hole. So let's see if, you know, I can do better next time. Um, and so with that, you get to share again. I shared my story.
I'm really good at failing at cooking. Really good at it. And baking. Yeah, does anyone notice the trend here between those two sets of answers? One. You look like you have the answer, Amy. Yeah, it, these are low stakes things, right? That we're much more comfortable with failure in things that are kind of like hobbies. Um, and so this is kind of what we have to confront. And this is actually something I get asked often when we, when we talk about this research is, you know, but that's golf or cooking or dancing or running or whatever. And this is my career. I can't fail when it's my career. And so really what hopefully I will um, be able to convince you of is that, yeah, failure is not good. But if you're willing to fail, um, yeah, so it's much easier, but, um, and the stakes are much higher, but if you're willing to fail, you're actually going to be more successful. And that's because, you know, if you think about it, if you're afraid of failure, you might do things you in the lab, like not even set up an important experiment. Cause you're like, oh no, what if that fails? You feel kind of gross about it, you're afraid. Um, and then you just kind of put off and put off and put off setting it up. Um, this is one I'll circle back to in a minute, you know, subtly sabotage it, maybe even like subconsciously sabotage it. So that way, when it doesn't work, you're like, oh, you know, I kind of, ah, it wasn't going to work because it wasn't quite right. Um, you know, it wasn't me. It was the experiment. Um, you know, if you're afraid of failure, you're less likely to get help and advice, either with setting up your experiment or after it doesn't work. Um, and you'll be much more likely to, you know, just kind of give up instead of trying again. And so, um, looking at that, you know, this is kind of what happens when we have fear of failure. And, you know, I, I think we could all agree that these are not things that are going to make us more successful. Um, and so, you know, this lands us with like, what can we do about this as researchers and as educators? And again, if you're a graduate student, you are both a researcher and an educator, just like all faculty are. And so we really need to think about this. Um, and so for us, um, for me, this, this really started about, gosh, four or five years ago now. It was it 2019? Yeah, almost five years ago. Um, I've had many career-changing conversations with my PhD advisor, um, and, and this was one of them that uh, we were actually, I was hosting him, my PhD advisor is Jeff Moore, we, I was hosting him for a seminar at University of Utah. We were like driving back to his hotel after, after dinner. I was going to drop him off, and we we're just chatting. He goes, oh, have you read this book, Mindset, uh, by Carol Dweck? I was like, no, I haven't read that. What's it about? It, you know, come out a few years earlier. He goes, well, it turns out how you view your abilities can determine your success, right? So this doesn't even have anything to do with failure yet, but it will. I was like, wow, it sounds like I should read that. And so I picked it up and I kind of eventually read it. Um, it's a pretty good book. I highly suggest it, actually. Um, apparently, I've heard it can be a little bit difficult to get through, but it, the message is really, really good. Um, and I found something in there that I couldn't ignore. And actually, another area of social science tells us that really like our actions, we think our actions are gonna be motivated by things we know we should do, but really our actions are motivated by things that we can't not do. So you often do something because you just can't not. You're like, oh, I see that. You're not like, oh, I see that, I should do something about that. You're like, oh, I see that and it's so bad that I can't, I can't see that and not take action. And this was it for me, which is reading about this and realizing, you know, having what I'll talk about is this fixed mindset um, creates a fear of failure. And that leads us to self-sabotage. So we have an excuse when things don't work. So going back to that one point, and I put two and two together and said, okay, so in, in our lab, you know, I've done research. I've failed, you know, literally tens of thousands of times, right? Like when I was in grad school, probably 95% of what I tried to do failed. So, um, and maybe people in our group, I think, have a better success rate than I did in grad school, but I failed 95% of the time. So what does that look like when we work in a place where, you know, I'm going to be failing 95% of the time. Um, and then if I'm afraid of failure, I'm going to be sabotaging things 100% of the time because I'm always afraid of failure. What does that look like for our success as researchers? And that just landed for me. And I was like, oh my goodness, if, if we're not doing research the best, and I spotted times I did this as a grad student. I was like, oh, all of these times I didn't do my research in the best possible way I could have because I was, you know, had this subtle kind of fear of things not working out. I saw it even in how I would write grants. I would see some little weakness in the grant and that horrible voice in my head would say, no, just leave it there because then if you don't get it funded, you have an excuse. And it's like, what is that? 
Like we want to write the best possible grant. So now it's like, okay, I recognize that. I'm going to go fix that. I want it to be the best it can. Um, but this was kind of where our psychology uh, does things that aren't great for us. And so, um, so what is this all about? So um, I'll go into a little bit about what it's about and then tell you the story of, of how we you know, got into doing what we're doing. So this is kind of now you, for you as a, as a grad, student, grad student or postdoc, why does this matter and why should you care and why should you maybe read a little bit more about this? And you might have learned about mindset like in you know, high school or college, um, and you might have learned about it kind of well, but I will also warn you that if you like kind of roll your eyes when you hear about mindset, um, often a lot of the stuff Carol Dweck has actually talked about, things that are done in like K-12 schools aren't always implemented very well. So if you're like, Ugh, mindset, um, bear with me. So um, yeah, so what is it? So Carol Dweck says there's kind of two different ways you can view your abilities. There's this fixed mindset where it's like, okay, everything is just set. All of your talent, intelligence, abilities are set. You are born with like a genetically encoded set of numbers that's like, uh, you know, you have a 72 in math and a 36 in music and a 54 in history and this in writing and this in dancing and this in golf and this in cooking. And uh, you have these set of numbers and basically your job as a human being is to walk around and try and find the things you're best at and do those and try and make sure that everyone sees that you're really good at those things. So you're really driven by the desire to kind of appear intelligent or talented. Um, what the growth mindset says in comparison, see a lot of people um, are kind of, often this gets misconstrued and it, you hear the growth mindset means like you can do anything. And, and you know, that's maybe not quite true. You know, if you're five one, you might not be able to play in the NBA, right? But what the growth mindset says is, you know, you, you do have certain things, you know, genetically. We have different personalities. We have different capabilities. Like for me, math has always been kind of a little bit, you know, pretty easy. Um, and dancing has always been very difficult. I have like zero rhythm. I have like negative amounts of rhythm. Um, but <laughs> unlike, okay, I'm just, I'm stuck with that. The growth mindset says, there's a big range around those abilities. Like if I really, really wanted to, I could probably be just as good at dancing as I am at math. If I put in the work, I can grow that ability. Um, and actually that is my one, I will tell one funny, embarrassing story. Um, my favorite growth mindset story actually is about dancing in that, um, actually the same retreat that I'll talk about in a minute, um, you know, my, my research group was really into uh, Dance Central on like the Xbox 360 thing. I don't even think it's a thing anymore. Um, they brought it, actually it was to our first retreat. They brought it to our first retreat and everyone was having a blast playing and they were like, Jen, you have to do this, you have to do this. I was like, uh-uh, no, <laughs> like I do not dance. <laughs> I do not dance on a plane, on a train, you know, whatever. <laughs> I do not dance here or there or anywhere. <laughs> um, not at weddings, not at parties, not at group retreats, not anywhere. Um, and then as I sat there, you know, over the hours that we were doing this and, um, and I just I never kept egging me on to do it. Um, and I was like, man, everyone looks like they're having a lot of fun and I'm kind of missing out. Um, and so I, you know, kind of said, okay, I'll do this. Like all the cell phones go on the coffee table. And if this shows up on YouTube, like <laughs> there will be penalties or whatever, but, um, yeah. Anyhow, I think I said jokingly, if this shows up on YouTube, somebody's not getting a PhD, but I didn't mean that. But, um, but yeah, and then I, I played and I had a lot of fun. And, and, and when I realized like, okay, I'm, I am really bad at this. It was probably really embarrassing and awkward. Um, but then I went home and I was like, oh, that was actually kind of fun. So I did, you know, like what all adults do. We went and we bought an Xbox, you know, like for our kids, you know, <laughs> for the kids. Kids need an Xbox. Um, and we got Dan Central, you know, for the, for the kids because, you know, the kids need to jam to Beyonce or something, you know, or, or Jay-Z and learn how to dance that. So, so we're getting an Xbox and Dance Central for the kids, but, you know, oh, that just kind of looks like fun. Maybe I'll play so that I can teach my kids how to play. Um, and, and I just, like, started doing this and started practicing, and, you know, practicing. <laughs> um, but I actually, like, I still don't have much rhythm, but I actually got, like, halfway decent at it. Um, and like came back to group retreat the next year and actually held my own and actually won one round of Dance Central. And I'm sure I looked super, super awkward doing it, but, but yeah, but I was able to do that. And actually the, the more serious part of that is I never danced at weddings. I was just sat on the sideline, like, oh, I just don't do that. And I realized I was missing on so much fun. And now I actually go to like weddings and parties and I dance and I have a lot of fun and it's a really great time. So that's my uh, somewhat uh, winding and embarrassing story, but kind of about growth mindset. That's something that I realized 
I had always been just really, really bad at. I thought, you know, I, I bet I can get a lot better if I work at it. So um, you might at this point now really be thinking, well, what does any of this have to do with failure? Um, but hopefully I'll bring you back to that, which is that um, this mindset has everything to do with how you approach a failure, not only when it happens, but even before it happens. That if you have this fixed mindset, if you're like, well, I have this genetically encoded ability for research or chemistry or whatever it is, um, you know, you avoid situations where you might fail because what if you fail? What if you're like, well, I thought I was pretty good at chemistry, but then if I fail, is that gonna mean I'm not good at chemistry? Um, or if, if my experiments fail, is that gonna mean I don't belong in, re in grad school? I thought I belong in grad school, but if it fails, maybe I don't belong in grad school. Right? Um, there's no productive path forward after a failure. You're just stuck. Um, but with the growth mindset, um, it opens you up to kind of take risks, to do things that might not work. Because if something doesn't work, it just shows kind of where you're currently at. It just shows, okay, I need to learn something. You know, there's experiment doesn't work. Either I need to learn something new about how to set up that experiment differently, or there's just something in science. There's we thought it would work because we thought that, you know, molecules work this way, but it turns out that they don't, and we just need to figure that out. Um, and so you're not only capable of kind of overcoming these short-term failures because you have this path forward, but even just thinking about being in situations where you have to take a risk, you're more able to do that because you know ahead of time, well, if it doesn't work, it just means that I need to go and get help and advice and try it differently or keep learning. It doesn't mean that I don't belong here or that I'm not good at what I do. So it's kind of the difference between this or this. Um, and so, you know, this kind of brings you back to our story of, you know, I, I, I read this book and thought, gosh, this matters um, a whole heck of a lot for what we do in graduate school. And so our group has this retreat um, for like three or four days every summer. And we were coming up on our, our 2015 retreat. And the first one had been all about research. Thanks, Mark. But I'd read this book, and so um, you know, again, I, I took a risk, something that might have failed. I said, hey, I, I think it's like this is really, really important for us as a lab um, to talk about this. And so what, what would you think if we you know, did a little session um, on this at our retreat for like an hour and a half? And we'll all read the book. I'll buy everyone a copy of the book in advance. We'll all read it. And then we'll just kind of like, you know, there'll be a presentation. Someone, uh, one of the grad students in the lab gave a really amazing, super powerful presentation of how this had impacted his life. Um, and then we talked about it. And I was like, you know, we might have to like talk about like our feelings, like maybe a little bit, but you know, it, it won't be that bad. Um, you know, it's not something we usually do in science, but, but it's super, super important. So let's do it. And um, the group was amazing and, and was like, yeah, let's, let's give this a whirl and, and let's do this. And so um, some of the things we talked about, actually some of these slides are almost directly from that retreat. Um, most of them have been changed, but we talked about how, you know, there's these mindsets and I talked about what they are and how they impact failure. But really what they do is that you start with this little assumption about your abilities and then that cascades into like huger and huger and huger consequences. And so um, the typing on this is really small, I apologize. Um, but from the, the fixed mindset, you know, you kind of like avoid challenges in the first place. Uh, if you hit a roadblock, you give up. Um, future effort is worthless, right? Because you've already decided, oh, I'm bad at chemistry, so why try more? Um, you ignore feedback, you know, that's just, oh, why do I want to have someone then show up and tell me I'm bad at the thing I've already discovered I'm bad at? Um, so then your only option, if you can't get better, you just hope for other people to get worse. Um, and that's not great, right? Um, whereas from the growth mindset, you can say, oh, it's kind of a fun challenge. I like challenges. You know, we all do this in our hobbies. We all embrace challenges in our hobbies. You know, if, if something doesn't work, you're like, oh, this is a more difficult one. I'm gonna learn and grow through this. Um, you know, effort is worthwhile. You can learn from feedback. You know, how many of us have a hobby that we like enough that we've ever had a coach um, who helps us? You know, I have a running coach because I love running. So I wanna get feedback on my running from my coach so I can get better at it. Um, and then, you know, because you know that you can succeed, it's easier to cheer for the success of others as well. And so again, this small little assumption turns into like a lot of really bad things or a lot of really, really good things. Um, and so an example of this is, you know, if an experiment fails, this is something uh, we talked about at a retreat, you know, well, from the fixed mindset, you might not have even done in the first place or you sabotaged it. Um, if you get a bad result, you can't own it, right? You kind of shift the blame. Trying again is pointless, uh, but you might give it a half-hearted effort to keep your 
your advisor happy, right? Um, so that's not great. Uh, but from the growth mindset, you can say, well, you know, this might not work. I'm going to go into it. I'm going to recognize it might not work. That's not going to say anything about me as a scientist. It just means it doesn't work. Uh, but you can still give it your best, right? That's 100% of the time giving it your best is going to lead to more success than, than self-sabotage, right? Um, if it doesn't work, you know, you can kind of say, okay, this is a challenge. I'm going to dive in. Uh, try again is worthwhile because you can grow and improve and get there. Um, and at the end of the day, it, it doesn't matter so much what other people think because you know you're doing your best. And it still absolutely, absolutely matters what you get done in grad school. But again, if you're not worried what other people think about you, you're actually more likely to be successful and get a lot of things done. Um, and so, you know, again, when you look at this, you're like, which one of these is more likely to lead to success? And it's definitely the growth mindset. Um, so kind of back to the, the narrative with our lab. We talked about this at our group retreat in 2015. And I started teaching that fall. And, and this is really where it, it crossed over as I realized, yeah, we're talking about this in the context of our research. But undergraduate students in our classes, they really need to hear this too, right? Um, this is super important. And they might not hear this from anywhere else. I need to hear this as an undergrad. And I learned it by working in a research lab, but I wouldn't have learned it anywhere else. Um, and so that fall, I gave a, a lecture. You know, you can even see like kind of some of these similar slides here um, and here and one of my stories. And I gave this talk about mindset to my OCHEM class. And people were like, thank you for doing that. That was so great. Like, you know, yeah, we've never heard this anywhere else. Um, so that went well. But then I realized, well, you know, I mean, I guess this is kind of a lecture, but we've, uh, we've had some active learning. But, you know, it's like, oh, a 50-minute lecture. Like, that's like probably the worst teaching style out there that there is. We can do better than that. Um, and so I was actually, uh, there was a, a call for education research proposals. And so I thought, I really want to like develop this whole like, you know, failure training idea. Um, and we can do better, you know, I'll still have a little lecture, but we can do better than that. Um, we can do things like, you know, let's have students go on social media and, and brag about their failure. Actually, a few people in the audience were TAs for the class where we piloted this. Um, and this was a lot of fun, and students wrote reflections about their, how they viewed failure and how the class changed their view of failure. And so I wrote a proposal, developed this, and then while the proposal was, you know, being reviewed, I was like, well, I might as well just start doing this, right? Because this seems kind of like fun. So, um, so I did that, um, and, you know, yeah, kind of recognized, you know, we wanted to make this better, get assessed, and be disseminated. We want to, you know, figure out if this is working and get it to other people. Um, so that's what the money was going to allow us to do. Uh, but then I failed. I got that proposal rejected. I actually didn't even make it past the first round. Um, and that was the best possible thing that ever could have happened. Um, because if we'd been successful, I would have had to do it exactly as I wrote it up in the proposal. Like, you know, just been me hiring postdocs and doing the stuff in my classes and having someone assess what's happening in my class. And just, you know, one class a semester, a few students, only chemistry students. Um, but what happened is that it was very fortunate that right about the time that this got rejected, we had decided we were moving to Emory. And when you move, you get startup funds to do cool new things in your research. And, you know, we kind of recognized like, okay, well, yeah, we need to like buy HPLCs and do all this stuff. And, and we definitely wanted to start some new areas of research on the chemistry side. Um, but we also, you know, I kind of thought, you know, talked to the group like, what would it look like if we just take like a little tiny bit of this money and set it aside to hire a postdoc for two years? Um, and, and, and just get this going. I'm like really passionate about this. I, I really want to fire this up. Um, and, what, and actually at our retreat that year, I had the assignment of thinking about what would that look like? What, okay, so how do I hire an a education research postdoc? And what would they do? And what would that all look like? And I realized, okay, this is just going to be better if we launch it as a big nationwide collaborative. And I never could have done that in the context of this proposal. And so we did. So we uh, rounded up about a dozen of our <laughs> of our best friends from all across the country who were really excited about doing this. Uh, some of these people are here at Emory, some are at Georgia Gwinnett, some are um, all over the place. Some, some of, one of my former colleagues at Utah, Colorado, all over. So we said, what if we just get together, you know, psychologists, education researchers, and people like me, STEM instructors. Um, we hired two postdoc researchers. So uh, Shayla, who's now moved on to a program officer position, and Meredith, who is still uh, in our group. Um, we found the right acronym. This is important for like any initiative. Um, and so FlameNet, Failure is a Part of Learning a Mindset Education Network, um, was born. And uh, our model is exactly this, that we said we want to do something powerful in this space. And 
you know, everything that we're doing is really grounded in psychology and psychology research. And I don't have a PhD in psychology, right? Um, so we're doing psychology research, but then also we're developing educational interventions. We're developing stuff that gets used in a classroom. I never learned how to do that either. Um, but then also we want to actually be using this. So we kind of said, if we want to develop things that are solidly grounded in psychology, have kind of good educational intervention structure to them, but that people like me will actually want to use in their classrooms, we really need to get all of these people together in a room. And so that's exactly what we did. We brought together a whole bunch of people. And now we have uh, 50 people who showed up last year in that first photo uh, to make our network. And we have kind of two sides. I won't go into this too much. We have the, the research side where we really do want to dig into psychology. There's a lot that's just not even known that we need to know in order to be able to design effective interventions. But then we really want to do a practical thing of, of developing things we can do in our classes um, that help students, help our undergraduate students develop more comfort with uh, failure and, and establish this growth mindset. And then we want to disseminate that and keep building it, make it bigger, um, and then change the culture of undergraduate education everywhere. So, um, so that's our goal. So what do we do? Um, as of right now, we've, uh, there's more on the way, but we developed in, in the first year and implemented two different intervention streams. So um, if you're a TA here at Emory, you might have even uh, gotten to participate in these. Uh, one of those was for lecture classes where we have what's called an exam debrief where students just take their exam and uh, they look at incorrect answers. So instead of just being like, ah, I don't want to look at that. I don't want to look at my mistakes. We kind of have some wording that's like, hey, make a mistake is, is okay. And the important thing is to learn from it. Like, let's dig in. Let's really look at what went wrong and try and learn from it. And there's a lot of kind of messaging around these psychological constructs of goal orientation and coping and, and growth mindset. Um, and then the second one is for lab. And this was really inspired by research, right? It's, um, you know, kind of looking at it was lab courses where things are kind of not going to work often. Um, and so students are encouraged to think about, well, you know, it's, it's okay to fail, but let's think about what didn't work. Let's think about how you can deal with that. Let's think about how you move forward from that. But all while realizing that a failed experiment does not mean that you are a failure. It just means it doesn't say anything about your identity. It just says something about how you did the experiment and you can always try again. Um, and one of the fun parts about this is that there's a kind of a digital communication, which is like a video or whatever. Um, so the students at the end of the class make a video all about kind of failure and growth mindset. And then we show those to the students at the start of the next class. Um, and so the undergrad students in our lab with cameos from some of the grad students in our lab made a cool video that I'm not gonna show because I didn't know if the video would work with all the sound and stuff, but you can find it on YouTube. It's really, really cool. I have a really, you realize uh, acting is one of those where I am naturally born with a very low number. Um, but that's okay. I could get better if I practice. Yes, I'm going to skip over this. Sorry. Uh, I thought I'd taken that. Oh, no, it's going to. Okay, well, maybe we are going to watch it if it plays. I guess. Yeah, I don't think that's going to work real well. So I'm going to hopefully be able to get back to the Zoom. Oh, no. No, we're still on it. Oh, no, I want to go back to my slides, though. Can I do this? Oh, there we go. Cool. I don't think the sound would work, and I know we're running short on time, so I'm going to get through the rest of this. But uh, it's recorded, so you can go pick up the link and go view it. Um, it's super, super classic. It's a play on the office. It shows you further that I get to work with really talented, creative people. Um, but yeah, I want to spend the last couple of minutes um, just talking about a little bit more about even the education research that we do. So this is kind of what education research can look like, is we realize, okay, well, we want to do this research where we're going to kind of reduce fear of failure. That's one of the goals. It's to reduce fear of failure. Um, but how do you know you've done that? So you need to be able to measure fear of failure. And we realize if you don't have good tools, you can't collect good data, right? We all know this as scientists. Like if the NMR is like horribly miscalibrated or the mass spec is horribly miscalibrated, you're not going to be able to get good data. And so um, what we realized as we looked out is that there were these measures for fear of failure but they weren't properly calibrated for undergraduate STEM students. And so um, we said, we need to do something about that. So this is one of them, it's a PFAI. Um, and has kind of 25 questions across five different factors. So there's kind of five different reasons why we're afraid of failure. And within those, there's uh, five of these statements for each. And then you kind of do one of those like Likert scale things where you indicate how much you agree or disagree with each of these. Um, but we said, okay, well, let's make this STEM specific. And so Meredith Henry, and Shayla Shorter and all of our team 
we created a STEM specific version of this. So it kind of gets students to think about a time that they failed in a science class or in STEM. And then it asks specifically about how they felt about that failure in STEM. And we gave this to uh, 1,300 undergraduate STEM class, uh, students across a whole bunch of, you know, nationwide, across all disciplines. Um, and then what Meredith did is used a really cool statistical method that I don't only marginally understand, but she is a pro at, which is called exploratory factor analysis, where you kind of just throw all these 25 items up in the wind and say, in the original one, they sorted into these five different, uh, five different uh, factors. But let's just see, you know, what comes out of this. It's like doing principal component analysis, if anyone does that. Um, and what she got is that one of the factors completely fell out. So fear of evaluating one's self-estimate just disappeared. Not relevant for STEM failures, which is actually kind of encouraging because maybe that means that in science, we're already starting to convey that, you know, if you fail, it doesn't mean you're a failure. It doesn't mean you're any less of a person if you fail at something in science. So that's actually quite encouraging. And then the other really, really interesting thing, so we, we lost one factor and we decreased 10 of these items dropped out, but one, and all of them kind of stuck with their original factors, except for one, this one right here. When I'm failing, I blame my lack of talent. Um, this used to be on the fear of devaluing one's self-estimate, but it showed up here on fear of an uncertain future. So um, it's really, really interesting that undergraduate students statistically, with statistical significance kind of link talent with their future abilities. And so we're really excited to kind of dig into um, what's called qualitative research now, where we actually get into responses and interviews and things and try to understand, you know, why is it that this now maps on here? And then why is it that we also kind of lose this part of the scale? Um, so that's where we're at with the research. Um, but I just want to wrap up with kind of like one more story, because again, you might be thinking, okay, well, this is really great until a big failure happens, right? Like, you know, what do you do when you do fail big? Like there are some failures that you can feel like you can't recover from. Um, and so I wanted to tell a story that's actually really personal to me, um, but I think can be encouraging when you think about those big failures and has kind of a good outcome. So you remember that 2015 retreat I talked about? Um, so that turned out to be, you know, right before I was going up for tenure. Uh, and my tenure vote was two months later and it did not go how I expected. Um, it was not as positive as I expected. Um, I did eventually get tenure, but, but I had to sit in this moment of, you know, wow, I, I thought it was gonna be successful. And now I have, for all intents and purposes, I have failed. Um, and that was, I think, quite literally the worst day of my life. Um, not so much because I had failed, but because I had failed so many other people. You know, I had to go and tell my research group that. And I will say that the thing that got me through that day is that our research group just came together and was like, all right, well, this happened. We're just going to keep on moving and, and we're, we're just going to get past this. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> I wasn't about to give up five minutes ago, but yeah, yeah, we are. We're going to get through this. But, but having to say, you know, this happened and I talked to my research group and I had to go home and get on a plane with my family to go to my brother's wedding like an hour later. And so it was just this crazy chaos of like trying to have these meetings and like running out the door and literally throwing the suitcases into the car and driving to the airport and it's so crazy. Um, and embedded in that, you know, my spouse was like, you should call your PhD advisor, which I then did. And he gave me some, we talked at like 6 a.m. the next day and he gave me amazing advice. So your PhD mentors are mentors for life if you, if you choose wisely. But, um, but I'll never, ever, ever in my life forget, you know, it's just this really big rush and, and we finally get on the plane and it's like the three seats and I've got two kids and my spouse and he's like, and we had like three seats and then one. And, he was like, I'm going to sit here with the kids and you're going to sit in that one seat and you're going to have a minute because you need it. Like you need a minute to be alone and, and process this. Um, and I'll never forget sitting there. They close the door. I'm like alone for the first time in, you know, the hours of just seeing what I think is my career unraveling from this huge failure. And that is like the lowest moment of my life because I'm sitting there thinking, I failed, you know, I, my ego got in the way, I thought it was gonna be okay, and it wasn't, and because of my ego, now I failed in this way that I've not only failed myself, but I've failed my research group, and I failed my family. So basically, I have blown it for all of the people that I care about the most in this world.
And that was awful. And it was horrible. Um, and it was a huge failure. Uh, and it was the best thing that ever happened in my career. And so um, this actually got me really, really interested. I, I noticed this after it happened. And we got through it, got tenure, moved here. It was amazing. Um, but it made me realize there's this cool concept of transformative resilience. So we know about resilience. I've been talking about that. That's accepting adversity and coping with it. Um, but there's this thing called transformative resilience. And this is not just you know, getting through it. This is actually like thriving through it. This is getting through something and coming out of it even better and stronger and more able to impact other people in a positive way with it. It's transforming a bad thing into something that actually benefits you and benefits the people around you. And so, so I just wanted to kind of share that because you know, as a result of you know, this biggest failure of my career, as a result of like the lowest moment of my career, you know, right? You recognize you're stronger than you thought you were. You know, if you've been through some difficult situation, you might have ahead of time seen other people go through that situation. And you think, oh, I can never, I can never deal with that. But what's happening, you don't have a choice. You know, I think we, we go through this when you see like hurricanes on TV and you see these people whose homes are flooded, you probably have that thought of like, if that ever happened, like I could never get through that. But when it happens to people, they, they have to deal with it. And, and you know, you find that strength when you need it. Um, and the thing I went through is nearly as bad as having your house flooded, but, but yeah, you realize you're stronger than you thought you were. Um, you get a lot more empathetic, right? Um, a lab dynamic that is forever changed. You know, if, if you want to change, if you're a faculty member and you want to, you know, we're already kind of trending towards this idea of how we run our lab, but if you want to forever, forever, forever change how your lab works, you go through something like that where you have this epic failure and rejection and then uh, your group says, okay, we're in this together. We're just going over where you need to go. We're, we're gonna keep being a group. We're gonna keep doing our research. Maybe it's here, maybe it's somewhere else. And we're just, we're all gonna get through this together. Um, it will never be the same. And it will never be the same again in a very, very good way. Um, create a vision for transforming academic culture. If I hadn't gone through this, there would be no me on Twitter. <laughs> I wouldn't have had the courage. I wouldn't have had the fire. Um, and you care more about achieving your goals and what people think about you. Um, also, know me on Twitter or in CNN if I worried about that. And so um, with that, I want to encourage you, what's an area of your life you can adopt more of a growth mindset or an area where you can have less fear of failure? And then I promise I'll wrap up. This is your take home. I think every good meeting should have like goals, an agenda, and an action item. Okay, you always leave with something that's your action item. Homework's on the next slide. Programming, oh, that's something I need a growth mindset about. I went to college in the 90s and programming wasn't really a thing we learned. Writing, yeah. Writing used to terrify me. I have very fixed minds about it. Nice. All right, so that's good stuff. So your homework is to recognize your failure isn't the goal. It isn't about trying to fail, but it's about recognizing that you can have courage to try your best even when failure is possible. So whatever you decided on that last slide, um, wisdom and seek out advice. So get help, get advice, get, uh, get mentoring. Um, if it doesn't work the first time, you know, keep going, keep growing. And, uh, and if you have a big failure, you know, have the vision to actually not just say, you know, in the moment, you might just be like, I just need to get through this. But then afterwards, think, how can I actually transform this into something that has purpose and benefits other people and that I grow through personally? Um, and hopefully recognizing that, you know, being willing to fail and, and, you know, transforming your failure could be a key to your success. So with that, I'll wrap up. Um, there's a whole other set. I thanked all the people in our collaborative. Uh, this is the other set of people that I really need to thank. Um, people often ask me why I'm like so enthusiastic and it's because I get to get up and do this fun job with amazing, amazing, amazing people. And so, um, yeah, our group is just filled with people who are driven and creative and fun and, uh, and are the reason why I get to, get to do this job and the reason why I come to work every day. And so I'm very thankful to them um, and to the people. This has all been funded by the National Science Foundation uh, and by Emory University. And thank you so much for, uh, for joining in person or online and for your attention.
All right. Do you want to do questions? We could do questions or not. If people have questions, we could put them in the chat or we could just uh, stop if we're near the time. Okay. There's questions here. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You have hit it exactly on the head. That, that's exactly what we need to do. Um, and, and Carol Dweck talks about that a bit in her book, that it's actually changed how I like talk to my kids. because And it made me realize a lot of things like, yeah, when you're brought up being told, oh, you're really smart at this, or you're really talented at that, all of a sudden that instills that fixed mindset of like, oh, it's because I'm smart or talented, not because I practice. And you know, for me, that made me really hate doing those things because then I was always like, oh, you know, actually golf was my one. I was like really talented at golf. So then every golf match I did competitively, and it was like, oh, if I get a bad score, then it means I'm not actually talented. And it's, it's yeah, this huge identity threat. And so I think we absolutely need to change the culture and it's towards praising like, hey, yeah, you worked really hard at that. Like you really stuck with it or you really dug in and found the right resources or you went after advice and, and you've grown a lot in that. Um, so yeah, I think change the culture in that way and also change the culture so that we talk more openly about our failures. There's a, um, an interesting little uh, not really scientific experiment that I did where I asked people, how often do you think you're failing? Do you feel like you're failing? And how often do you think the people around you are failing? And we think we're failing a lot more than we think the people around us are failing. But if we're all thinking that, the numbers don't add up. And so I think we think, oh, I'm failing all the time, but everyone else around me is just succeeding all the time. And I think the more we talk, and that's so, you know, it feeds into all the imposter syndrome and all of that. And the more we talk about failures and struggles, the more we just normalize that and kind of move past it. Okay, we have a, a question in the chat. Oh, cool. And then we have one in the back. So we'll do the chat and then, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that, yeah, that is a very, very real thing. And that's why, um, you know, kind of that slide of like, that's golf, but this is my career. Um, and so I, I don't, I don't ever want to minimize that very real, like, yeah, if you fail, you might not have a backup plan and you might not have options going forward. Um, so it isn't to minimize like, oh, that's not a big deal, but it's to recognize that if you, if you kind of can get into this growth mindset, um, that can kind of minimize the fear of failure. But that, that alone is not the goal. It's really that by minimizing your fear of failure, you're much more likely to be successful. So if you can't fail at your job and you're terrified of failing, then when things aren't going right or you make a mistake, you're less likely to reach out for help. You're less likely to get coaching. You know, they look at this with executives and stuff too. Um, and, and you're less likely to take risks and things like that. So uh, it's moving past that fear of failure that will actually help you be just more likely to actually succeed when it matters the most. Does that make so sense? Her, her response is also sometimes failure isn't the best thing to happen. Sometimes it's the worst thing to happen. Yeah. Anyway, your successes don't necessarily always Yeah, you know, I think um, I, it, it actually one of the one of the theories, one of the psychological constructs that we we work with is called attribution theory, um, and really interestingly is tied to mental health and to depression. And it's this idea of you know, are are you in control? You know, are 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 you ha is life happening to you or are you happening to life? And it, it gets at that idea of when something happens. You know, yeah, when a failure happens, one of the worst parts is it makes you feel like you are not in control, right? Control is taken away from you because there's something you wanted and now you can't have it. Um, but the thing we always can control is our response to it. Um, and, and actually the transformative resilience work came not actually out of failure, but, uh, but some of the most transformative and some of the earliest work on transformative resilience actually came out of um, the concentration camps from World War II. 
And so it, it's hard to think of uh, uh, many situations that are, are worse than that. But they studied, you know, who afterwards of the people, you know, who, who made it through and who, who survived. But then even afterwards, who was able to, of the people who survived and were rescued, who was able to um, kind of go on to live a normal life um, because there were actually really high suicide rates, not too surprisingly for, for the survivors from that. Um, and, and so Viktor Frankl was the, the psychologist who studied this. And, and this is what he found is it was the people who were able to um, kind of employ this, this attributions, this uh, it's called uh, 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 internal locus of control and kind of transform this and say, well, I can't change that that happened to me, but I can change how I view it, and I can view that as something that made me stronger. I can view it as something where I can find something in that where I can now use that experience to go and help someone else who is going through something really, really terrible. And so, so he kind of, that, that's essentially where a lot of the transformative resilience research uh, got started is, is with that example. But I, I, I know, I always, uh, I, I never want to sound like I minimize, I feel like, because I know that there are really, really terrible things that happen, especially in academia where we have this power structure where, you know, it, it can be kind of unrecoverable. Um, and again, you, you, it's impossible to stop those things from happening. Um, but, but when those things happen, as unfair and unjust as it is, um, we can still control how we respond to it. One more question. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, th this is a really popular idea, and I think the field just needs to make a way to find, make a way for this to happen. I think we actually are coming up on a way for this to happen because, yeah, just on a practical level, you think about all of the time that's spent trying to do something that a lot of other people have tried to do, and it's failed, and we just say, look, it doesn't work because of this. Um, then we can even try and say, well, well what can we do to make it work? Um, but yeah, also but yeah, celebrate things that things that where you have a really awesome failure. You're like, I thought it was going to work because of this, but now we have really good evidence for why it doesn't work, and we learn something from that. And that can really contribute to knowledge of the field, but because it didn't work, we can't publish it now. Um, and I, my really practical answer is I think that having preprint servers is going to help this because you can post a lot of, you know, you have a lot more flexibility of what you pr post on a preprint on Chem Archive or BioArchive than what gets into a peer review journal. So we can actually put some of those things out there that we couldn't before and get, get access to them and advertise them and promote them. Um, I also have, um, actually when I gave this talk at University of Illinois, talking with some of the, the, the postdocs in advance, we actually came up with a whole new funding model that we want the NIH to employ that would promote a really, really outstanding failure. And I, I think it'll take a while to make it happen. But, but yeah, it's around that idea of, you know, if you realize your project just isn't going to work, instead of having to toil away at it for three more years because that's what you're funded for, even though you know it's not going to work the best, have actually a little reward. And, and this is not, you know, have a reward of like, hey, if you prove to us you really, really tried hard and, and you killed it for a really good reason, we'll actually give you like even a little bump in your funding and you can keep going and do something else. Um, and while that sounds crazy, this is what some of the technology industries do. So if you look at like Google X, you know, they actually reward people who kill their projects. The best way to get a bonus or promotion is to kill your project and, and get data that shows like this is not going to work and here's why and here's why we shouldn't do this anymore. Um, and that might sound, everyone's like, oh, people will just be doing things that like don't work on purpose. It's like, nah, you know, we're humans. We want to succeed. The drive to succeed, the drive to have it work is so powerful. We're still going to try and make it work, but if you can at least kind of reward that, that really hard failure, um, that's how you make progress. Because again, if, you, if, if it's bad to fail, then we like kind of sidestep around it and do all the easy things first and the hard thing last. And this is how they drive people to do the hard experiment first. Um, Yeah. 
Um, you know, I probably have a narrow view of that because on uh, in so so I would say, I would say yes, but that's only because uh, if you're in social media, if you're on Twitter, there is like a huge movement around this happening on social media, which is one of the amazing things, right? Like Instagram is like, here's my perfect life. And at least my Twitter feed is like, here's all my insecurities and failures and, and, and people like supporting each other. So I, I think that it's happening, maybe not across the whole field, but I think that it's happening in certain spaces. And actually a really fantastic example of this is that uh, Kathy Drennan at MIT, a structural biologist, one of my heroes, um, and super, super famous HHMI investigator and HHMI professor and a billion awards. Um, she made this video for HHMI where she talks about her dyslexia and she talks about how um, she was told, don't even bother taking the GRE because you could never go to grad school. Um, and how, yeah, there was that moment of kind of, you know, just all of this early failure and early failure and frustration, but then how actually her, her dyslexia is what allows her to uh, be able to understand protein structures so well, because she had to learn to decode words in this kind of shape sort of way. And so she said, ah, I think that gave me this special skill for just really understanding shapes and understanding how shapes fit together and recognizing patterns among shapes. And that's what kind of made her successful. So I think that there are, there's kind of this like CV of failures movement where faculty, you know, create this, you know, here's all the grants I didn't get funded. Here's all the papers I got rejected. So I think it is, it's slowly changing in places, but you know, like any things with culture, it kind of starts and then it, it takes time to spread. But I, I think we're trending towards being, we're trending in a positive direction on that. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. And any feedback, welcome on the, the talk. <laughs>